Welcome to H360 Health Talk. I'm joined here this afternoon with Dr. Sophie Barsich and Dr. Kathleen Ruddy in the first of a four-part series on breast cancer. Dr. Sophie was born in New York City, groomed in the sciences at a very early age. She received her undergraduate degree in psychology at Cornell University, focusing on behavior and interpersonal relationships. Compelled by a growing interest in design, she attended the Parsons School of Design while working at the Fashion House of Calvin Klein. Realizing she wanted to become a physician, she attended Columbia University and received her medical degree at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. Dr. Sophie then accepted a position into an independent program in plastic surgery at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Today, she's a plastic surgeon specializing in breast reconstructive surgery for mastectomy patients. Dr. Ruddy, uh, the author of The End of Breast Cancer, A Virus and the Hope for a Vaccine, is an internationally recognized breast cancer expert, founder and medical director of the breast services at Claire Mass Medical Center in Bellevue, New Jersey, founder and president of Breast Health and Healing, her private practice in New Jersey, founder and executive director of the Breast and Health Healing Foundation, uh, and creator of the ongoing Pink Virus Project. She has launched a couple of mobile apps. The first was uh, Breast Health GPS, using GPS technology to locate the nearest certified mammogram screening center uh, in the country and connecting those patients to her website, her blog, and networking sites. Her most recent app, Lobby Me Pink, provides contact information for U.S. Senators and Congress people and allows users to send emails directly to advisors of every member on Capitol Hill. Better Homes and Gardens names it one of the six most important innovations in the fight against breast cancer. Today she cares for her patients in her private practice while working tirelessly to grow the Breast and Health Healing Foundation, whose goal it is to discover the cause of breast cancer and to use that knowledge to prevent the disease. Welcome, doctors. It's so good to see you. Thank you. you. So we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, This is the first in a four-part series that we want to do. We're going to talk about prevention today. And you know, Uh, October was obviously Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The city here in New York turned pink. Central Park was pink. A lot of people coming out. Um, But still, there's a lot of unknowns around breast cancer and the causes and the treatment. And this is a wonderful book, The End of Breast Cancer, uh, A Virus and the Hope for a Vaccine. Very interesting. We want to get into that. But let's talk about prevention. There's so much talk about food and diet. And tell me, does that or does that not really play into a breast cancer diagnosis? Dr. Sophie? Well, I think that there's a lot of talk about diet in general for a lot of things. There's a lot of food fads out there, and every day there's something that you should avoid, and if you've ever eaten it, you're going to explode. So I think we have to try and temper that a little bit. Um, as far as what we, we, we suspect a lot of things, but as far as what we know, the only thing, to my knowledge, and Dr. Reddy will, will let me know if I'm right about this, that we know, uh, we're learning about right now is alcohol. And we do know that alcohol has, plays a role in breast cancer in women, especially in postmenopausal women. So other than that, people are looking at whether red meat plays a factor, whether there's any other fac- things in food and specifically the estrogens in food. And we do know that that is relevant, and soy is always implicated. We use soy for a lot of things. What people might not realize is it's not just the edamame soybeans, and it's not just the soy milk, but there's a lot of soy filler in food and processed foods Mm -hmm. that is there to replace the fat that was taken out because fat makes you explode. And there's a lot of kind of things around that. So there are a lot of things in food that were not there before. And anything from soy does have what's called phytoestrogens or plant estrogens. And the way that we know that these do impact you is that we actually recommend to postmenopausal women to eat more soy to replace their estrogen. So we know that that estrogen does actually work in the body as an estrogen. But everyone's going to be susceptible to different degrees, just like every breast is susceptible to different degrees and every tumor is susceptible to different degrees. I don't think it's fair to completely 
say you should never have something at all, but I think these things are important to discuss. And if you are taking in a lot of extra estrogens or a lot of extra alcohol, it's probably something you should think twice about. Now, Dr. Kathleen, we don't want to alarm anybody when we say <laughs> alcohol plays a role. <laughs> is there a guideline that you could recommend? Is, uh, is it one glass of wine in the evening or is it one bottle of wine? You know, what, what should we be focused on here? Well, <clears throat> I don't think you want to alarm anyone about anything. You just want to give them the information that you have that you find valuable, that may be valuable to them. So we know, based on multiple studies, prospective studies, retrospective studies, large studies, published in peer-reviewed journals, that <clears throat> as much as or as little as half a glass of wine a day uh, will increase your risk for breast cancer. It does. The question is why. So we have an idea about why this is the case. And I think if you understand why and you understand that, then you're in a better position to say, well, you know what, I'm going to have a glass of wine with Thanksgiving and I'm going to have champagne on my birthday. Other than that, I'm going to steer clear of it. So what goes on with alcohol? Well, as it turns out, your liver is responsible for clearing the bloodstream of alcohol. You drink alcohol and your liver is like, okay, we've got to get rid of this. Um, because it's a toxin and it just needs to be metabolized and excreted. Um, while your liver is doing that, your liver is occupied um, and it cannot clear the estrogens that you may be making, either that your ovaries are making or if you're past the point of ovarian function, then the estrogen that's made in fat, the estrogen that you're ingesting one way or another. And so the estrogens um, are now put on hold in terms of metabolism and as a result, the blood levels of estrogen rise. So there's no question that estrogen is a factor in the equation that drives breast cancer. So if you're having a glass of wine, whatever, uh, your estrogen levels will rise and they will stay elevated for about six hours until your liver is done with the alcohol and then it can get on to metabolizing the estrogen. So don't be alarmed, but at least understand this is what happens when you drink alcohol, your risk of breast cancer will, will go up because we know estrogen drives the growth of breast cancer. And if you abstain from alcohol, for the most part, um, that risk is not imparted by the alcohol. Now, I know Cortland has some questions that <coughs> she wants to get out there, but I have to ask a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Because we talked and you led with alcohol in postmenopausal women. What about men? We have breasts too. Do you see mm, the same mm, correlation mm. in alcohol consumption with male breast cancer? Great, great question. So um, the relative increase in estrogen in men who we know are alcoholics, but certainly to a lesser extent men who are drinking on a regular basis, um, will certainly drive any estrogen dependent tumors but you don't have a lot of breast tissue to start with because when you were going through puberty you had your Y chromosome and the testosterone and so the breast tissue that was there to be developed was not developed uh, and so you don't have a lot of uh, breast tissue on the line uh, you have other things on the line perhaps prostate cancer certainly fatty liver disease and so on and so forth so what we see is that you begin by having breast tissue so men in general don't have that. Uh, and then you uh, perturb that system in such a way that it evolves into a malignancy. Less of a chance in men because they don't have the breast tissue to start with. Got it. So I do have a follow-up question to mm -hmm. this. Um, and I think you kind of got into it a little bit when you said um, estrogen-driven tumors. Yes. So we know there's many different kinds of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Does alcohol um, increase your risk for one certain kind of breast cancer mm -hmm. over all of the others, or is it mm -hmm. just elevated for all breast cancers? That's a brilliant question. So let's talk about what happens on the, um, the entry-level uh, incident. So... Um, Think of this as a plane going into the building, 9-11, mm -hmm. okay? It's the plane that starts the problem. What happens after impact, all of the subsequent catastrophe um, is not exactly predicted from the plane going in, but without the plane going in, you don't get the catastrophe. So estrogen um, is a 
growth stimulating hormone. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does it do? It causes breast tissue to grow. It causes the uterus to grow, the lining of the uterus to grow, all kinds of things, brain changes, okay. Um, so estrogen is a kind of growth hormone. Now, let's take this farther down the road. Now you have a breast tumor mm -hmm. that perhaps to one degree or another, very likely, um, was stimulated, its growth was precipitated by estrogen, among other things. But once the cancer gets going, it's like the plane going into the building, uh, and that tumor, let's just say this table is that tumor now, um, that tumor may or may not express estrogen receptors and be responsive to additional estrogen in the environment. Mm. So estrogen may get the thing going, but estrogen may or may not be a factor in its future growth. Um, so you have to distinguish, <clears throat> and it's an important distinction, because women will say, well, my tumor doesn't, is not estrogen receptor positive, mm -hmm. so hmm, I can drink alcohol. No, back up, it's the plane. Mm -hmm. Drives growth, drives malignant transformation, whether or not you're expressing an estrogen receptor or it's a partner, a progesterone receptor. Right, that's a very good explanation that I think a lot of people um, will be able to understand. And then we talked also about you know plants that um, increase estrogen in the body, like soy. Mm -hmm. And so you know we know that red meats really play a factor in developing certain cancers. So is living your life with a plant-based diet you know, the best thing to do because you can also increase your estrogen levels with plants, you know, like, so what, what should we do so, here? I, I think, mm -hmm. I personally am a firm believer in moderation. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything mm -hmm. is so bad for you, well, few things are so bad for you that they should be avoided entirely. Mm -hmm. I also, I think now, you know, we've gone from fat is horrible to sugar is horrible. Yep. And people are walking around mm -hmm. and they're not eating a piece of fruit because it has sugar and then they're feeling mm -hmm. woozy and passing out at work because they have no sugar for their brain. <laughs> so I think you have to sort of take a step back and try and be rational about things. Um, I think one thing people forget a lot is that all medications come from plants or foods. That's mm -hmm. where they originally come from. So when you're mm -hmm. eating, you're actually getting small doses of what could have become a medication if mm -hmm. someone had isolated it, concentrated it, and put it in a pill. Mm -hmm. So everything you have interacts, and people don't realize that as well. A lot of homeopathic medications, mm -hmm. over-the-counter medications, herbal remedies, these are all other versions of medications and drugs, and everything has an impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and looking at the studies on meat and breast cancer in particular, there's no clear answer from what I've seen. And there's some who tried to figure out, is it how well you cook the meat, how charred it is, whether it's grilled versus sauteed versus, you can really, if you want to, you can really make yourself crazy with yeah. this. <laughs> and I, I caution people with that. You know, you'll go to your mm -hmm. friend's house and say, well, how was this prepared? Because mm -hmm. I can't eat the cancer meat. I mean, you have to just take a step back. So I think anything in excess seems to be not a very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, in my personal opinion, I think it's more about the artificial stuff. Mm -hmm. Because though mm -hmm. that's the stuff that we don't really control. That's the stuff that we don't really know about. Things that occur in nature tend to occur in doses that we can handle. Mm -hmm. And things that we make tend to occur in doses that should have never happened. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. you're processing food and you're putting all this soy filler in it, you're getting a lot more estrogen than you get from eating a bowl of edamame. Right. Because it's not supposed to happen in right. that form. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to happen in the other form. Mm -hmm. So I think instead of thinking this is good and this is bad, I think I, what I call a natural diet is better. You know, whole foods. Right. Like, you know, eat, eat the actual thing. Mm -hmm. Eat a hamburger mm -hmm. that's made with regular meat. Mm -hmm. Don't eat a soy veggie burger mm -hmm. and you don't know what they put in to try and make it look and smell and sound like a hamburger. Yeah. So I've always been a firm believer in that. And every 20 years, the thing everyone told me I shouldn't be eating turns out to not be so bad. And the other thing that they were all eating turns out to be a problem. So I think it's more about staying with what's natural, staying with what's whole, and moderation in all things. Right. Yeah. I do think that people who live a, a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle think they're being so much healthier. But you bring mm -hmm. up a really good point mm -hmm. of we make all these fake chicken patties. Fake proteins yeah, are fake very dangerous. Jerky. <laughs> but you know, yeah. what's going into that to make it seem like a meat? And if you're living a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle, 
do you really need a fake chicken patty? You know, <laughs> right. You can have a complete meal without that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's processed foods, right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. so if people say, well, stay away from sugar, but natural sugar, I'm, you know, I'm going to have that apple or mm -hmm. so yeah. getting that versus a processed sugar, you know, white, white breads or mm -hmm. anything processed, um, I think is bad. We, we touched a little bit about homeopathic areas. You know, this whole area of supplements, gosh, you walk into the pharmacy and there's aisles and aisles mm -hmm. of supplements. And if you read the label carefully, none of them are approved by the FDA. They're not going to prevent anything or cure anything. Is there a balance there? I mean, you know, if, if somebody has less than the perfect diet, is um, taking a daily vitamin or some other supplement a good preventative measure? Or should we really focus on the diet and stay away from the supplement area? I think in some cases the answer is yes. And it is um, <clears throat> a product of the um, change and deterioration in our food supply. So not just the processed food, but some of the what looks like good food that looks green and leafy and so forth, except that the soil has been depleted mm -hmm. or uh, it's been on the back of a truck for 10 days. And so by the time it gets to you, there's not much left of it except for fiber. Um, there are two uh, supplements which seem to be um, very helpful with regard to cancer, breast cancer, and osteoporosis, which is not our subject, but we might as well talk about it because this is important. The first is vitamin D3. So in our food supply now, we're really not getting uh, the vitamin D3 that we used to. Uh, that may be in part because we're inside, you know, we're not out there in the sun as much as we used to be. We're inside because it's hot, we're inside because it's cold. Um, so vitamin D3, appears to be, um, if you're evaluated and you're low in vitamin D3, it would be wise, I think, to add that to your uh, daily supplement intake. The other thing that I find recent data being very compelling and converging is vitamin K27. And most people aren't really even familiar with vitamin K27. But it turns out to have been very much part of our food supply up to about 80 years ago. Uh, and it's in grass, and we don't have any animals or dairy products except for grass-fed um, mm -hmm. that are eating grass anymore. They're getting grain. Mm -hmm. So the vitamin K2 is now not in our food supply. And so what does vitamin K2 do? Um, first of all, you need to ingest calcium. That's number one. You need to take it in. Then you need to absorb it, and vitamin D3 will help you absorb it. Now it's in your bloodstream. Now where is it going to go? It needs to be put into bone. Um, vitamin K27 puts it into bone. Um, it also takes the calcium out of places where it shouldn't be, like your coronary arteries, mm -hmm. and puts it into bone. Mm -hmm. um, it helps stabilize stem cells that might be getting a little funny. It interrupts uh, the proliferation of malignant cells. And so when you begin to look at the epidemiologic picture of what has happened to our country over the past, say, 80 years. You've lost the grass-fed food supply. You've lost the vitamin K27. You have heart disease, osteoporosis. It's very helpful for Alzheimer's disease, increase in cancer. Now, it's a very complex system, and so it's never one factor uh, causing you know, all of that downstream trouble, but it could be a factor. So I recommend, and I take vitamin D3 and vitamin K27 every day. Besides this very balanced diet yeah. that Sophie <laughs> suggests, which is wise. Um, speaking to the supplement point, um, I have two issues with supplements in general. I, I don't think that globally they're bad, but I think people overdo them. But the, the other issues I have is, you know, we were never meant to take in vitamins on their own. That's not how we're designed. And when you learn in anatomy and you learn in chemistry and physiology and you go down to the receptors, all of our receptors that take in all these little tiny atoms and molecules and all these little supplement pieces that we think we're taking with the vitamin, they're actually designed as carriers most of the time to take them in in a certain environment mm -hmm. or with mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. And there are carriers that won't work with just the one person. So mm -hmm. it's almost like a ski lift. There have to be all three people on or it's not going to go. Mm -hmm. So when you take this pill, you think you're getting all that stuff 
first of all, if you're getting too much of certain things at a time, your body won't even absorb it. So you just get rid of most of it. So most of that pill, that part of the pill is useless. And then if you're taking X, Y without Z, that's not going in either. So much as Dr. Reddy was mm. describing, you know, the D3 on its own is not going to help if you have no calcium, and that's not going to help if you don't have the K2 set. They work all together. Mm. Food is designed to give you things in those patterns, and the pills are not. They don't sit there and say, we better put all three of these things in the pill so it'll work. Mm -hmm. So most of the supplements people take don't work, mm -hmm. at least not remotely the way they imagine they do. Um, the second part of it, which is also, as a surgeon, very concerning to me is because these supplements are not regulated, you have no idea what's really in them. Mm -hmm. And they get processed mm -hmm. as well. And mm -hmm. they get processed with stabilizers and preservatives mm -hmm. and all these other things to help them have a shelf life mm -hmm. and help them stay looking like a pill and not just disintegrate when you open the jar. Mm -hmm. And what are all those things? We have no idea. Mm -hmm. What effect do they have on you? Mm -hmm. We have no idea. What effect do they have on the medications you're taking? Mm -hmm. We have no idea. And patients come in for surgery and they say, oh, I'm taking this pill and that pill. And if you don't ask them, and what else do you just put into your body? Oh, the rest is just herbal stuff. Mm -hmm. They can have a, a series of 10 different other things they're taking that might put them at serious risk in the surgery. And they don't think of them mm -hmm. as medications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm constantly trying to get the information out of my patient mm -hmm. about all the other stuff that they're taking yeah. that they don't categorize that way and that is more concerning than any of the medications they're on. And so that's a constant battle, I feel. Yeah. That's a really good point. You know, a lot of people, I think, don't categorize their supplements as medications, but they do have interactions. Um, one thing that we touched on a little bit was fiber. And we mm -hmm. know that mm -hmm. your increase in dietary fiber can help yeah. decrease your risk of colon cancer. Yeah. Do we see the same um, correlation in breast cancer at all? I don't think directly there's been a relationship between fiber per se mm -hmm. and breast cancer. What we know uh, based on our fiber studies, so you know we went down the drain with fiber mm -hmm. and what did we find? We found the microbiome, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And it was like, who would have thought that was important? It didn't look important, right? <laughs> right, right, right. It turns out to be enormously important. What's mm -hmm. in your gut? Enormously right. important for your immune system, for your brain, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It controls brain development, I mean really. And so uh, we've got to take a, this microbiome very, very seriously, not just with regard to fiber, the kind of fiber that you put in, mm -hmm. um, and what else could you put into your gut that would allow your gut to heal and allow the gut um, lining to function optimally and therefore help your brain, help your immune system. There are a lot of things that we can do. A lot of it has to do with fermented foods and, and good fiber. Mm -hmm. um, that's another subject. I think it's definitely worth um, having a discussion about that at some point in the future because that is one of the things um, that is now cutting edge, innovative. You need to know about it. We need to learn more about it so that we can implement it the microbiome, and mm -hmm. fiber is just a part of that. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting here in New York, the melting pot of the world, mm -hmm. and when we think about this, and our, our topic is, you know, plays right in to the relevancy of this, cultures, diets, do you see certain diets or certain cultures when, and unfortunately cancer doesn't really care about that. It, cancer can appear in anybody at any time, as we know, but do you see in certain cultures and the kinds of diets that they maintain, those patients may be having better outcomes or maybe getting through treatment uh, a little easier or maybe even the numbers of those cultures being reduced in the area of breast cancer? Let me begin by providing an equation for cancer. This is uh, not just my hypothesis, but I think it's based on good data. Uh, and it's been around for over 50 years, probably close to 100 years. So how do you get to cancer? Remember back in high school, 10th grade, algebra equations, all these factors equal zero or equal one. <laughs> Very scary, okay? Uh, we're going to try not to make this too scary. 
But there were multiple factors in the equation. With regard to breast cancer, there appear to be three factors in the equation. The first is the virus. And like cervical cancer, whereas there are other contributing factors to cervical cancer, if you pull the virus out of the equation, if you pull HPV out of the equation, out of the equation you do not get cervical cancer. The hypothesis that the majority of cancers are caused by viruses was put forward in the 1950s at the National Cancer Institute and was widely held at the time until the race for the cure and the war on cancer got involved and then the whole idea about viruses causing cancer was sort of left at the curb. I maintain that the majority, if not all, of breast cancer is related to this virus. We know that virtually all of cervical cancer is related to HPV. 65% of head and neck cancer is related to HPV. The virus is an integral factor in the equation. That's the first factor. The second one is a genetic predisposition. We know that if someone were to walk into this room coughing and hacking, got off the plane with your husband who has the flu. <laughs> your husband walks in, where's my Aww. wife? Okay, he's got the flu. We all get a dose of the virus. <clears throat> Are every one of us going to get the flu? Let's say we're not, we didn't get the vaccine this year. No. Well, why? We all got a good inoculation from you know this wonderful man, but we're not all gonna get the flu, why? Because we've got a genetic predisposition that either welcomes uh, the influenza virus or we've got other factors going on. So a genetic predisposition in the presence of a virus helps to determine the extent to which that virus will penetrate the system and develop the cancer. Without the virus, no cancer, but even with the virus, you're gonna to have to have those genes. What, what is the third equation, uh, factor in the equation? That's a big factor, we'll just call it X. And it can be estrogen and alcohol and fiber and the water that you drink and the air that you breathe and the stress that you're under and so on and so forth. But basically those are three equations. So when you look at different cultures, and this falls under the category of what am I supposed to eat? You've got cultures that are vegetarian and they have a low risk for breast cancer. You have cultures that are meat fat eaters, they have no breast cancer. Meat fat eaters, the Eskimos, no breast <laughs> cancer. Okay, the Dakota Sioux, no breast cancer. The Japanese, no breast, what's going on? What am I supposed right. to eat? Right. Mm -hmm. Again, I refer to the virus, the genetic predisposition, we have to take those very seriously. And then when we get to, well, what can we do today while we're working on the virus, while we're trying to understand the genome, what can we do today under that big X factor? What can we do to lower any of those other factors that are driving this equation? And when we look at cultures, we end up with, oh, vegetarian Japanese, Eskimos, high fat, high, <laughs> what are we supposed to eat? Right, right. <laughs> Just do your best. <laughs> well, you know, the, this whole notion that the, the second um, part of your equation intrigues me, the, the virus, right? What do we do when we that's have a virus, first, right? That's the first factor. Mm -hmm. We, we, we factor. develop a vaccine. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, Dr. Sophie, what gives? Where, mm. where's, where's our vaccine <laughs> here for breast Dr. cancer? Dr. Reddy, where is our vaccine? <laughs> well, tell me what you think, so, because you, yeah. you heard the story out no, of the sure. blue. So. <clears throat> so I never, so I've been taking care of patients for years with breast cancer in the sense of doing their reconstruction, working with breast surgeons, working with oncologists. And when I met Dr. Reddy a couple years ago and she said, do you know about the breast cancer virus? I said, what breast cancer virus? Um, I was fortunate enough to find out about it. I'm sort of sobered by the fact that it's been out there for so long and it's not common knowledge and there aren't more people making sure that this is something we are working on as a priority. It also is very sobering to me that every time I mention it to another one of my colleagues, either an oncologist, a breast surgeon, or a plastic surgeon, they look at me and say, what breast cancer virus? I think that it's, you know, it's very multifactorial and very, very layers of the onion kind of situation. There is a huge machine that is at work diagnosing and treating breast cancer. And I don't think that we have globally put it into the category as a preventable disease. Um, and I think that as long as we're focusing on diagnosing and treating, it's very hard to shift gears and say, wait a minute, we could just go to the beginning and 
start prevention. I don't think there's enough general knowledge even within the medical community and I think that it's like anything else there's probably some resistance as well. If you look at the story of HPV and even pap smears, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Dr. Pap was you know <laughs> laughed out of the laughed out of the office and, and thrown mm -hmm. out of the onto the street and told he's being ridiculous. And now we know how important that is and now we can go even one step further. We know about HPV and who would have thought? Um, you know, when I was in, in medical school in my second week, there was an infectious disease uh, cert, a doctor who had gone to my medical school and who always came and spoke to the medical students, and her name is Shari Madonic, and she's amazing. And I remember it was my second week of medical school, I knew absolutely nothing, and she came in and she said, the reason I became an infectious disease doctor is because all disease is, cured by, is, is, um, all disease is caused by infection. And I remember we looked around and we said, okay, well, that's mm. obviously in her world. And she <laughs> said, you will see by the end of your careers mm -hmm. that all disease is caused by infection. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of time before we make the appropriate, connect the dots in the two columns. And I never forgot that she said that. Mm -hmm. And every couple of years, something <laughs> comes up and I say, Sherry right. Madonic was right. <laughs> sure. All disease is caused by infection. Yeah. But I don't think we globally have really understood that. And I think once we do, mm -hmm. it's the same way with the microbiome, that once we understand the mm -hmm. balance between the different infections, the kinds of infections, the bacteria that we have that help or hurt, I think that we're going to start to look at everything in medicine a little differently and stop going for the Band-Aid mm -hmm. and start going for the prevention. Mm -hmm. yeah. So prevention is the main topic of this particular episode. And if we were to really suss this out and find a vaccine for the human mammary tumor virus, um, would we see you know, ultrasounds, mammograms, breast MRIs go by the wayside Similarly, with the HPV vaccine, if we're able to get everyone covered, will we see pap smears go by the wayside? You know, what impact will this have on prevention and research? I think so. We are now, based on, again, converging, compelling data published in peer-reviewed journals, um, in addition to a sprint to the finish line that is now being run by the Israelis and the Italians, with regard to this breast cancer virus. Um, we are now 85% certain that this virus plays a role. In my opinion, this is my considered opinion, it's not just my belief, um, this virus causes breast cancer, all of it, one mm -hmm. way or another. Whether or not it can be easily found or not, that's another question. Um, if you're 85% certain that a virus causes a cancer, the question is, what is the likelihood that you're 100% wrong? You can be wrong. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. I'm going to keep an open mind. But if you're 85% certain, and you've got converging data coming in from all continents, you know, all areas, and it's peer-reviewed um, by substantial people, you know, from MD Anderson and MSK and the NC, okay, big, big hitters. Um, <clears throat> The chance that you're 100% wrong is not zero, but it begins to approach zero. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are correct and we can get the money and the attention, and thank you very much for your opportunity to be able to do this, and thank you, Sophie, for joining in. If we could, you know, go up Heartbreak Hill mm -hmm. <laughs> and get there before, say, the Israelis or the Italians and complete the research, you're absolutely right. We can get a vaccine. As a matter of fact, the Israelis and the Italians have developed a vaccine mm -hmm. and a screening test and a monoclonal antibody that targets the virus. Mm -hmm. And they have found that the virus is spread in human saliva. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, big deal. We could absolutely take the whole thing off the table in the same way that we have taken polio and the braces and the iron lung and hot springs, Georgia, it's gone. Mm -hmm. We have other things that we can do, but we can take that off the table. That is what is at stake. This is why I'm so passionate about this, because I see it. Again, I stand to be corrected if it turns out you know, we're 100% wrong, but I don't think we are, and I think it's very compelling that we finish this research and get there if we can. So when you look at the research, how far along are we 
when we say mm, it's okay. important for us to finish? I mean, are yes. we are we just dipping our toe in the water, no. or we've no. got good data? Mm -hmm. You say there's data that's peer reviewed. We've got big hitters playing here. How far? How far along? Wh wh where are we going? It's, it's such a good question. Um, so if you're going to prove that a virus causes a human cancer, you cannot do a randomized prospective study, <laughs> right? I can't give you the virus, okay, and say, I'm going to follow you for 10 years and see whether or not you get prostate cancer. No. You have to get at that information in an in indirect way. And it turns out that there are criteria that were set up uh, by public health people, epidemiologists mm -hmm. at Yale and elsewhere. And there are six or seven, depending on the criteria that you're using, six or seven steps that you need to fulfill. So is there a scientific understanding of how the virus can cause breast cancer? Yes. Does the virus cause breast cancer in animals? Yes. What animals? Yes. Is there an epidemiologic association between the presence of those animals, which don't live in Japan, but live in the United States, these mice. Is there a relationship between the animals that carry the virus and the people that get the breast cancer? Yes. Um, are there interventions that you can implement based on the scientific understanding that would prevent the virus from causing breast cancer? Yes. What's left to do? When I say we're 85% of the way there, what's left to do? We must enroll a large number of women, which would not be difficult. Give me the money, we'll have them in 48 hours. Let's say we take 10,000 women and we screen them for those who have no evidence of the virus. And we can do that now by doing a salivary swab or a mm -hmm. blood test, okay? 10,000 women, they don't have the virus. And we follow them periodically, every year. And we identify those women who Zero convert for one reason or another, they bump into the virus. So the Germans did a study in which they looked at women who developed breast cancer and they looked at risk factors. And aside from having a BRCA mutation, what was the strongest risk factor for developing breast cancer in this cohort of German women, aside from having a BRCA mutation? Owning a dog. Mm -hmm. The virus is in mice, cats, dogs, monkeys, and in humans. You follow these women over a period of time, and you identify those women who seroconvert, they become infected with the virus, and you document, you answer the question. I say document, but you answer the question. Um, are those women at an increased risk for breast cancer? And if you have an answer to that question, you go to Stockholm and you get the Nobel Prize, because that's the last step. Everything else is done. That's why I say we're so close. Where is the money to do that study? Well, as I say, the Italians and the Israelis two years ago got together and they're worming their way around that prospective study. They're just saying, look, we have enough data now. What you could do, and this is also one of the criteria, but it's at the end of the story, what you could do is you could develop a vaccine against the virus, perhaps in Europe and China, and you could prospectively inoculate the population, and then you could determine that being vaccinated reduces the risk for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And you could get a train ticket to Stockholm that way. Mm -hmm. But that's what's left to do. There you go. The end of breast cancer, a virus, and the hope for a vaccine. Doctors, thanks for mm -hmm. joining us. Where can we find your book? Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> Sorry. Amazon is everywhere. We get our food, we get your book. And it, bookstores. Bookstores go to bookstores. <laughs> it is a must read. Great right. book. Mm -hmm. uh, again, The End of Breast Cancer, A Virus and the Hope for a Vaccine. Thanks for joining us.